This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Hi guys, welcome to Amateur Chemistry. So, in today's video, I will be turning just some regular batteries into this incredibly beautiful and vivid purple paint using a ton of really interesting reactions and processes. Now, as with many projects on this channel, at first such a conversion doesn't even seem doable, but judging by this video's existence and length, I found some obscure reactions that make this all possible. By possible, I unfortunately don't mean simple or even straightforward, since obviously there has to be quite a lot of work done before an ordinary battery can become some gorgeous paint. To understand why this conversion is even possible, we first have to take a look at the guts of a battery, and more specifically, a carbon-zinc battery. This is a fairly common type of battery, often present in many different sizes, and it is the most suitable one for this project, however, some alkaline batteries might also work. Anyway, these batteries are used to power a variety of devices, and if I take off the steel and plastic casings from one of them, you can see the shiny inside which produces the delicious power. It is made out of a metal shell composed of pure zinc which makes it really soft, Inside this shell lies the heart of the battery or a graphite electrode lodged deep into this black and moist paste, which apart from sticking to everything and always making a mess, contains something which with some chemical makeup can be turned into purple paint. This something is a chemical called manganese dioxide, it is normally a dark brown powder, but in this paste it's mixed with a ton of carbon and soaked with a solution of zinc chloride. All these elements together make the battery really good at providing power, however some of them also make turning it into paint incredibly hard. You see, for making the paint I will need to extract pure manganese dioxide from this messy paste, since all the carbon would make the final product extremely dark and practically impossible to use for painting. This extraction step is what I am really worried about, and since no one that I know of has done it like I want to on YouTube yet, I will have to come up with a new method which makes everything even more challenging. I could of course just buy the paint online or skip the whole extraction step by using store-bought manganese dioxide, but as I explained many times on this channel, I do such impractical projects to explore what's possible to make from simple materials, and such conversions are always a ton of fun, because just how cool is that you can turn a random battery into beautiful paint. Before I begin, I would really like to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. Squarespace is a professional all-in-one website creation platform designed to make entrepreneurs stand out and succeed online. Using it, you can create incredible websites with ease, whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, and use them to sell anything from regular products to your time or skills. Squarespace provides you with amazing features like their new and powerful Blueprint AI, which seamlessly guides you through the creation of your own professional website and makes it optimized for every type of device to build you a really unique online presence. Squarespace also gives you access to their next generation tools capable of creating and selling your own online courses, as well as their awesome Fluid Engine, which allows you to really unleash your creativity, which I myself tested and really enjoyed. For a free trial, head to squarespace.com, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash amateurchemistry to save 10% off your first purchase. Anyway, as I already said, the first step of turning batteries into paint is extracting some manganese dioxide from them. Before I explain the chemistry and tricks behind this extraction, I have to collect some material to process since the guts of just one battery are way too little to work with. I really wanted to scale this operation up since I bought a ton of batteries, so I proceeded to take apart 9 more for a grand total of 10. This whole operation was really tedious and took me like an hour, in the end leaving me with 5 kinds of decapitated insides of a whole battery family. I threw out all the plastic, steel and clean paper casings since I had no use for them, leaving me with some carbon rods, zinc and the manganese dioxide paste, a part of which was still stuck to some paper. Now, for this project, I really needed just the paste, but since I don't like wasting potentially useful things, I decided to keep the zinc and carbon rods, since I can use them for some cool reactions like reductions and electrolysis. 
When you look at them like that, carbon zinc batteries are a source of some really useful materials for a lot of chemistry experiments and it's honestly really cool that some unqualified congressmen didn't ban them yet like a ton of useful chemicals here in the EU. Anyway, now after my rant about politics, I can begin extracting my precious manganese dioxide from this thick black paste and first I have to wash away all the soluble impurities. To do that, I will need to soak the paste in a copious amount of distilled water and then filter and dry it, which is the classical way of doing such purifications, but just from the texture of this paste I knew that I will spend a better part of eternity on this step alone. There unfortunately doesn't seem to exist any simple trick to make all this go faster, so I just concentrated all my available patience reserves and got to work. Now before adding water to the bulk of my paste, I wanted to wash away the small amount of it present on the battery's paper components and I did that by using a squirt bottle over my new gigantic 2 liter beaker. I am really glad that I bought it because it slightly reduces the ungodly amount of mess created by this procedure. Anyway, when I finished washing off the paste from the battery papers, now it was time to add the bulk of it to this black mixture. I just kind of dumped it in all at once, which was rather risky but miraculously left my background intact, I then added in a lot more distilled water and manually stirred this thing for a few minutes. This left me with a pitch black battery paste suspension with this funky mirror like crust floating on top, which I now had to filter to remove all the water soluble junk. I didn't want to use my vacuum filter for that since if some carbon got stuck to its glass through it, I would die trying to clean it off, so instead I opted to go with gravity filtration. Since I didn't want to wait ages, I assembled this state-of-the-art filtration system, which with this lighting looks just like a floating sieve equipped with multiple coffee filters to maximize the filtration area. To start it up, I just filled it with all the wet paste and waited for the liquid to come through. This process, despite my ultra-optimization, was still painfully slow, resulting in me recording this beautiful shot containing my fruit-eating noises out of pure boredom. Anyway, when most of the water passed through, I washed this thing a few times to ensure I got rid of all the impurities. I could actually see that the water coming through the filter was now purer than before because of these cool waves forming when it combined with the rest of the filtrate. Anyway, after what felt like forever, my manganese dioxide and carbon mix should be quite pure and now I wanted to dry it since I wasn't planning on using a lot of it for the paint and for different experiments the carbon isn't an issue. To start the drying process, I loaded all the paste onto a baking tray covered in aluminum foil, which was really quite satisfying and damaging to my background. This actually gave me the idea to try out this paste as a paint, and it honestly works really well as a rich and smooth black. Anyway, to dry the paste, I got the tray into my good old electric oven and left it there overnight. In the morning, I took it out and before booting up my camera, I swapped out the aluminum foil for a paper towel because most of it was now mysteriously gone. I must have unintentionally created some kind of aluminum consuming battery on the tray, resulting in some aluminum contamination. The same thing happened to my steel spatula, which now looks like Swiss cheese. Fortunately, this metal contamination shouldn't be too much of an issue for making the paint, since their salts will all get removed in the last filtration step. Anyway, I now wanted to crush these big black chunks and since they were rather soft, I quickly pulverized them using just a mortar and pestle. With the powder ready, I weighed it and it turns out that after all this messy struggle, I managed to get 563 grams of some really pure manganese dioxide and carbon mixture. Now it's time to remove the carbon from this thing, and the first step to do that is to make something called manganese sulfate. It's a water-soluble form of manganese and can be easily made from manganese dioxide through a procedure that fortunately will leave only carbon behind. Before carrying it out, however, I have to quickly tell you about an online chemistry supply shop, BM Chemistry. They sell many chemicals, glassware and lots of other stuff, so if you are interested, there is a link to their page in the description. Anyway, to carry out this procedure, I first got 87 grams of a chemical called oxalic acid dihydrate into a beaker and dissolved it in roughly 400 milliliters of distilled water, which even with stirring took a good while. When most of it was in solution, I poured in exactly 70 grams of 98% sulfuric acid, which I extracted from a car battery in a previous video, 
It's a dish that really heated the mixture up, but apart from that, no chemical reaction occurred. The reason why I mix these two acids like that is because they really complement each other when it comes to dissolving manganese dioxide, since it's a two-step process and neither acid could do it all on its own. I will talk about the chemistry behind it in just a while, because now it's finally time to get rid of that nasty battery carbon. All that I have to do is just add my dry battery powder in small portions and the acid mixture should selectively pull out the manganese leaving the carbon behind. I started just with one small scoop and almost instantly after adding it, I could see a lot of bubbles evolving from the now incredibly dark solution. The reactions going on here are pretty straightforward. First, oxalic acid attacks the manganese dioxide itself getting destroyed, releasing a bunch of carbon dioxide and forming manganese carbonate. This form of manganese is reactive enough for the sulfuric acid to easily attack it, releasing one more molecule of carbon dioxide and forming my precious manganese sulfate. As you can see, these two reactions release a metric freak ton of carbon dioxide bubbles, which can easily overflow the beaker and leave a huge mess. I continued adding more of my battery powder and closely monitoring the bubbles to not obliterate my second background. Also, you probably noticed that the order in which I am combining the ingredients is optimized for complete consumption of the two acids and not manganese dioxide, and that's because I want to ensure that they are all consumed for the next reaction to not cause problems. Anyway, after a few scoops, the reaction got so cold that I had to cool it down using some ice, since a boiling acid solution was the last thing I wanted. At some point the bubbles stopped being emitted almost completely, signaling the end of the reaction. Now to finally get rid of all that nasty carbon, I just have to filter everything, and to do that I set up this simple gravity filtration setup and filled it up with the black manganese sulfate solution. It came through really easily, which was a nice break from all the previous horrors, the resulting filtrate looked kind of like pee, having this intense yellow color, while in theory a manganese sulfate solution should be pale pink. That's because of the presence of some iron contamination in the batteries, but as with all the other contaminants in this video, I'll just chalk this up to not affecting my final product and move on with the procedure. When everything came through, I washed the remaining carbon a few times with distilled water, resulting in quite a lot of this yellow solution. I placed it onto my new and beautiful rotating table, which I will probably use excessively for the foreseeable future, so that I give you more dopamine when explaining things. Anyway, now's the time to turn my manganese sulfate back into the dioxide for making the paint. This is actually the trickiest part of this project, since I haven't seen anyone doing it in a way that won't involve some obscure chemicals like potassium peroximonosulfate or large-scale electrolysis, which I've tried before using these lead electrodes, and to no one's surprise, it didn't work at all. I could theoretically react my manganese sulfate with another manganese containing chemical called potassium permanganate to form manganese dioxide, but half of it would come from the store-bought permanganate, which I didn't want contaminating my pure battery source stuff. After a lot of trial and error, I found a method that while still somewhat impractical and dangerous, seems quite accessible, and it involves the use of another pea-colored liquid you are all probably familiar with. This liquid is a solution of a chemical called sodium hypochlorite, also known just as bleach, and I discovered that it easily converts manganese sulfate to the oxide. Its use still isn't perfect for reasons I will showcase in just a minute. Anyway, to start the reaction, I measured out around 750ml of industrial 15% bleach, which is around 3 times stronger than the household stuff. I calculated this amount to be roughly enough to react with all the manganese sulfate, and to initiate the reaction, I poured some of it into my manganese sulfate solution, resulting in it quickly turning dark brown thanks to the produced manganese dioxide suspension, which made everything look like it was the product of some excessive Taco Bell consumption. To spice things up even more, a cloud of a pale green gas started to form above the mixture, and this is none other than the deadly elemental chlorine, which was used in World War I as a gaseous poison. It is produced in great amounts by this process, and that's why I did it all in a good fume hood. Also, another interesting observation is that a lot of the chlorine dissolved into the solution, and upon stirring it bubbled away, kind of similar to a carbonated drink. This means that I created some kind of warfare Coca-Cola, which is honestly just a typical chemistry moment. In terms of the reaction probably going on here, bleach or sodium hypochlorite attacks the manganese sulfate, 
precipitating some dark brown manganese dioxide and forming sodium sulfate as well as copious amounts of the deadly chlorine. This, combined with the really large volume of the bleach solution, makes this reaction quite unpleasant, but as I already said, it's the most accessible one I could come up with. Anyway, when I finished adding all the bleach, now it was time to filter out all the manganese dioxide, and unfortunately, it was in the form of this very fine precipitate, which always takes ages to filter. I also couldn't use vacuum filtration because all the chlorine would kill my vacuum pump, and if you've watched some of my older videos, you probably know that it's been through a lot already. This left me with the one and only option of large-scale gravity filtration, which would probably take even longer than the last time, and my already diminished patience reserves won't make this any better. Anyway, having no better idea, I assembled the exact same setup as before and filled it up with the reaction slurry. The paper filters actually started leaking this time, resulting in a lengthy cleanup after which I made sure not to repeat the same mistake again, this time packing the filter paper really densely. As expected, everything took a gigantic amount of time, after nearly two days, I was now left with some nice and washed, still very wet manganese dioxide paste, which I now had to dry. Similarly to before, I put it into my oven overnight. When I took it out in the morning, it shrank like 10 times and almost exactly like the last time. Before recording anything, I swapped the previous paper that the paste was on with a new one, since all the heat and exposure to chlorine made it ultra crumbly. Anyway, I ground the dry manganese dioxide using a mortar and pestle. It was noticeably tougher than the dry paste and looked kind of similar since it was so intensely brown that it was pretty much just black. I waited to see how much I got and it turns out that I managed to make just below 30 grams of some pure manganese dioxide from batteries. The yield is actually pretty bad since I expected around 50 grams, but for such a messy procedure, everything turned out quite good. Now it's time to finally make the paint, or rather the raw pigment, which I will then use to make the paint. This pigment is actually quite an interesting compound with a rather lengthy name, ammonium manganese pyrophosphate. It's often referred to just as manganese violet, and that's what I will call it. However, in my opinion, its color is closer to purple than violet. Its synthesis is quite interesting and weirdly straightforward, not involving any too spicy liquids or gases, and apart from my homemade manganese dioxide, I will also need two other reagents, which are ammonium dihydrogen phosphate and concentrated phosphoric acid. They are rather easy to buy, and if you have phosphoric acid, you can make the ammonium dihydrogen phosphate by just mixing it with some ammonia. However, I am lazy and bought mine from an online chemistry supply shop. It of course looks like just a generic white powder, and now to start making the pigment, I first have to mix 120 grams of it with all my manganese dioxide in a mortar. When I was done, I was left with this black powder, and now to make my pigment, I assembled this quite interesting setup. It's composed of a large oil bath with a thermometer and steering, which is actually required here, since this reaction will only take place at a whopping 220 degrees Celsius and require quite precise and even heating. Now, the last thing needed to make this process possible at such temperatures is 65 milliliters of concentrated phosphoric acid, since it will serve as both a reagent and a flux, allowing the substrates to freely react together, which wouldn't otherwise happen at such temperatures in the dry mixture. Okay, now with everything ready, I turn on the heating and steering. At first, I have to get the mixture to about 100 degrees Celsius and hold it there for half an hour. Steering is also required to mix the reagents, and at first the steel bar had a really hard time since the solution was incredibly thick. Fortunately, as it got hotter, the viscosity greatly decreased, allowing for some nice and fast steering. I don't exactly know what happens in this initial heating step, but there are probably a lot of dehydration reactions going on, as well as a lot of ammonium dihydrogen phosphate dissolves in the hot phosphoric acid. After half an hour, I turned my hot plate's heating to the maximum and isolated the oil bath with some aluminum foil to keep the heat in, since now I have to heat this thing to 220 degrees Celsius and maintain that temperature for about 2 hours. When everything warmed up, a lot of gas started being released by the reaction mixture, and this was probably just some steam, since in this step of the process, the most dehydration reactions occur. When it comes to the reactions going on here, no one knows exactly how they proceed, but the overall process involves the dehydration of phosphoric acid and reduction of manganese 4 to manganese 3, 
which in the presence of ammonium dihydrogen phosphate forms my desired manganese violet as an insoluble suspension. You can actually see the mixture getting a purple shade as the black manganese dioxide is slowly being turned into manganese violet. Also, at some point everything started to smell a little like french fries due to the oil heating up, resulting in my brain now associating the smell with the color purple. Anyway, as the reaction progressed, the mixture got more and more thick, killing the steering. To fix that, I sometimes added some fresh phosphoric acid to reduce its viscosity, which created this really satisfying crackling sound. Anyway, when the two hours were up, I turned off the heating and allowed everything to cool down overnight. When I came back, I first removed the oil bath and recycled the nice smelling oil to use again later. Now, when it comes to my manganese violet, it is now in the form of this hard and very dark brick, which I will have to process before using it as paint. To do that, I first have to remove any water-soluble impurities by dissolving this brick in distilled water. It turned out that it was very poorly soluble, and I had to come up with something to speed up this process. After some thinking, I decided to use my new and shiny ultrasonic cleaner, which through emitting a very specific and deafening sound, makes water much more efficient in cleaning and dissolving stuff, so I got the whole pigment containing beaker into it and left it running for about 10 minutes. This method worked even better than I expected, allowing me to keep my last emergency reserves of patients. Anyway, now with all the pigment as this nice suspension, it's time to boil it in water to break down any impurities into their more water-soluble form. To do that, I got the whole violet suspension into my biggest beaker and added in a random amount of distilled water. Now, to boil such a large volume of liquid in a reasonable time frame, I wanted to use something more powerful than my lab hot plate, so I went and got my rusty electric stove. It's similar to the one I used in my previous video, and if you've watched it, you probably know just how powerful these stoves are. This wall unfortunately lost its legs, so to make it stable, I substituted them with some homemade aluminum muffins, and when everything was ready, I got the gigantic wicker onto it and cranked up the heating. After just a few minutes, the whole thing started to gently boil, and it felt like I was brewing up some sort of an evil potion, Anyway, I left this thing to simmer for about an hour to destroy all the impurities. While the time was up, I got the beaker off the stove, and now it's time to filter away the insoluble pigment. This time I finally get to use my vacuum filter, and that really boosted my morale. Compared to the previous filtration, this one was just incredibly fast, and in only an hour I managed to filter and wash all of my pigment, which I then put onto my baking tray to dry in the oven overnight. This time when I took out the tray, I wasn't greeted by any unexpected surprises. The pigment now took the form of these hard chunks, which I had to grind down to make into paint. I however couldn't just use a mortar, since the resulting powder would be way too rough, so instead it was time to boot up my old ball mill. I made it a few years ago with the help of my dad. It looks well, very rustic and I was really surprised to find out that it still works. Its mechanism of action is that it quickly rotates a metal can filled with some steel balls and something you want to grind, sometimes for days, which results in incredibly fine powders. To grind my manganese violet, I just put it all into the steel ball containing can and sealed it up with some tape. I then secured it in the mill and turned this thing on. It was tremendously loud, but it looked like it was doing its job. I left it to run for nearly two days, and when I came back, it was now time to open up the can and see the results. I was very pleased to see lots of a very fine purple powder on the sides of the can. There were also some really big, unmilled chunks of the pigment, which looked like some nice purple rocks you could find by a river in a fantasy world. I weighed both the powder and the rocks and got them into these plastic test tubes for storage. My final yield of manganese violet turned out to be 74.3 grams, or around 89%, which is actually really good considering all the hiccups and problems along the way, and now it's finally time to make some paint. I theoretically could try to make some paint base from scratch, but I just wasn't feeling like it, so I bought these two tubes of black and white acrylic paint, which will be the carriers of my purple pigment and allow me to get some more shades of it. I made the paint by just combining some of the powdered pigment with the white acrylic, and the result was a somewhat thin but pretty purple, which behaves quite nicely on a canvas. 
I actually gave this paint to a person who, unlike me, is a really good artist and he painted me this beautiful picture of a seashore using only it and the black and white ones. It is really cool to think that this piece of art was once just some random batteries that I through some great struggle and tons of patience managed to chemically transform. This whole project was really quite an interesting journey and came out way longer than I expected. Anyway, thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did you can like it, share it with a friend and subscribe to my channel. If you are feeling extra generous and want to see some content unsuitable for YouTube like my new mercury distillation video, I invite you to join my Patreon. Also, as always, special thanks go to all my wonderful Patreons for their support and making videos like this possible. And see you guys in the next video.